Mark 10, 23 to 31, Possible with God. If you recall, our last study covered the interaction between the rich young man who asked Jesus a question. He had run up to Jesus and asked what he could do to inherit eternal life. Jesus never did answer his question, but he eventually told him that he should sell his possessions, give the proceeds to the poor, and then take up his cross and follow Jesus. This prescription would not give him eternal life, but would put him at a place where he could learn from Jesus, unencumbered by his wealth. Sadly, the man was too attached to his wealth to take such a step, so he left Jesus with great sadness. In today's passage, we will look at the conversation Jesus had with his disciples after the young man left. First of all, what does it say? When you read through these verses, it's easy to see two parts. In the first part, Jesus talks about how it's hard for those who trust in riches to enter God's kingdom. In the second part, Jesus talks about the blessings of leaving all to follow him. The first section is the truth about those who trust in riches. I'll read verses 23 to 27. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. So what does it say? After the rich man left unwilling to give up his wealth, Jesus looked around and spoke to his disciples. He said that it was hard for those with riches to enter God's kingdom. The disciples were astonished to hear this. Jesus repeated the idea again. He addressed them as children and said that it's hard for those who trust in riches to enter God's kingdom. He also said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. The disciples were astonished at what he said and talked among themselves, asking who then could be saved. Jesus looked at them and told them that it was impossible with men, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. Jesus was talking about people who have riches and who trust in them. It's very difficult for those people to enter God's kingdom. And this surprised the disciples and caused them to wonder who could be saved if the rich could not be. Jesus made it clear that it is impossible with men, but not with God. The second section is the truth about those who trust in Jesus. I'll read verses 28 to 31. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Peter told Jesus that he and the others had left all and followed him. Jesus told them a truth. No person existed who had left his house, brothers, sisters, parents, wife, children, or lands, for Jesus' sake and the sake of the gospel, the good news, who would not receive a hundred times as much now and eternal life in the age to come. They would have these things along with persecution, but many who are first will be last and the last first. So when Peter noted that they, unlike the rich man, had left everything for Jesus, Jesus responded by promising a multiplied blessing for those who left people and possessions for his sake and the gospel. Those who left all for him would receive a hundred times more of what they had left now and would have eternal life in the future. But he also noted that there would be persecutions and a reordering of importance. First will be last. So that's what it says. Now let's ask another question. What does it mean? First of all, Wealth can be an impediment to entering the kingdom. Wealth can be an impediment to entering the kingdom. Look at verses 23 to 25 again. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, 
How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So wealth can be an impediment to entering the kingdom. Do you remember how Jesus had responded to the rich man in the previous paragraph? He loved him and instructed him as to what he should do. When the man showed his emotional attachment to his wealth, Jesus noted how hard it was for rich people to enter God's kingdom. He said that it was like trying to push a camel through the eye of a needle. Now, numerous ideas over the years have been suggested to explain this unusual phrase, that it's a real camel being pushed through a needle, that's impossible, a large cable, you can't put it through a sewing needle, a small entrance gate where only people could go through and a camel would have to uh, get down on its knees and try to slide through that small gate. Whatever the case may be, and I, I think he's just talking about the impossibility of a camel going through a needle. So whatever the case may be, Jesus was referring to a seeming impossibility. A love for wealth often makes it impossible for some people to enter God's kingdom. Which brings up a question, what is the kingdom? We should understand the kingdom in two ways. First, God's current kingdom is his spiritual rule over those who have submitted to his leadership, so all Christians. Second, God's future kingdom will be revealed during the millennial kingdom when Jesus rules the world for 1,000 years. While the second will eventually happen, let's keep our focus on Jesus' rule over our lives right now. Now, what was Jesus saying? Jesus was showing that those who are controlled by their love of wealth, who are trusting in that, have a very hard time submitting to God's rule in their life right now. Just as the rich man was unwilling to give up possessions to follow Jesus, so many wealthy people have a hard time leaving their wealth for him. Wealth is the impediment that keeps them from entering God's kingdom. Another thought. Wealth is not necessarily a sign of God's blessing. Let's look at verses 24 and then 26. The first part of verse 24 it says, and the disciples were astonished at his words. And then verse 26, and they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? The disciples were astonished when Jesus told them that rich people and those who trust in their riches have a hard time entering God's kingdom. When Jesus repeated and amplified that statement, the disciples were even more astonished. Rich people have a hard time entering God's kingdom? How can that be? Now, we have to ask ourselves this, why were they surprised? One commentator says this, The dominant Jewish view was that riches were an indication of divine favor and a reward for piety. You see, in the Old Testament, God blessed people like Abraham and Solomon with great wealth. Because of that, it would be easy to think that the wealthy are always rich because God approves of them. Abraham was the friend of God. Solomon was was the wisest man who ever lived and was rewarded by God. The rich young man who had come must have been blessed by God, right? Well, not necessarily. Riches are not always a sign of God's blessing. So, our third thought. Wealth is not an impediment to God. Look at verse 27. 27 excuse me. But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So wealth is not an impediment to God. After seeing their astonishment, Jesus told his disciples that it's impossible with men, but not with God. All things are possible with God. What he wanted them to know is that God is able to overcome any obstacle, any impediment to someone entering God's kingdom. He can change their heart's focus and make them see what they should do. But this is something that can only be accomplished by God. And, you know, that reminds me, I think it's Ezekiel 28, 36, or something like that, where, where God promises to give the Jewish people a new heart that they would seek after him. And, and I'm reminded of that now because God is able to overcome any obstacle. 
wealth is not something that holds back God from saving someone. It can be an impediment to them, but God is able to overcome that in anyone's life. One more thought. Wealth can be measured in different ways. Look at verses 28 to 31. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we've left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So wealth can be measured in different ways. After Peter noted their acts of devotion to the Lord and leaving everything for him, Jesus noted that those who leave all for him will be rewarded with much more than they have left for him. He talked about leaving people and property and receiving a hundredfold or the highest return for what was left behind. So what are the dividends? When someone leaves all and follows Christ, there is the possibility that he will lose many things, friends, family, and possessions. But Jesus promised that what was lost would be eclipsed by what God replaced them with. I am of the opinion that Jesus was using hyperbole to describe what God would give. Not that there would be, uh, if, you, if you left a family, that you would have a hundred more families. Or if you left a, a rich business, that you would receive a hundred businesses. What he's saying is, God is going to give you much more than what you have lost or left for him. The family lost would be replaced by a family made up of many other believers, and that's what our church family is. We're a family of believers. The wealth lost would be replaced by God's provision through what he provided and what, the, what others shared. Remember when Jesus talked in Matthew 6 about not worrying, not being anxious for as God can clothe the, the field with flowers, he can clothe you, your body, he can provide for your needs, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God never promises to make us rich, but he's always promised to give us the things that we need, and his provision is enough, and it is abundant. But these dividends that he talks about would also include something that doesn't sound like a dividend, persecution. Edwards says this about persecution. He says, its presence in the list reminds disciples that Christian existence is not utopia, and Christian faith is not an insurance policy against adversity and hardship. That's true. The Bible elsewhere says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. This is one of the dividends that comes along with God's faithful provision. As Christians proclaim the truth of the gospel, people will be offended and persecution will happen. This is seen in how people treated the disciples and Paul in the book of Acts. They were beaten, imprisoned, stoned, and some were even killed because of their faithful proclamation of the good news. But there's something else that Jesus includes here in, in these words. He says, and in the age to come, eternal life. So what is the end result? Jesus was not looking for people to follow him simply for getting a hundred times more than they left. He wanted them to know that persecution during this lifetime would be a part of their lives, but he also wanted them to see beyond the troubles to what lay ahead for them, eternal life. All those who have repented of their sin and put their trust in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. We know from the rest of the Bible that this eternal life will be with God in a perfect environment. If you'd like to, read the last two chapters in the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, to see a full description of what that will be like. Here's a sampling, Revelation 21 verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. As James Edwards says, 
The reward of eternal life makes the sacrifices of discipleship look insignificant in comparison to the lavish blessing of God. He's right. In other words, the end result is much better than anything that is left behind to follow Jesus. Now let's ask our third question. How does all of this apply? First, remember the cost of following Jesus. Peter brought up the fact that they had left all to follow him, and that was true. Peter and three others had left a profitable fishing business. Matthew had left his lucrative tax collecting job. They were now following Jesus with no guaranteed income, food, or shelter. They had compared what they were doing to the call of Jesus and responded in the right way. They left all because they knew Jesus had what they needed. Are you willing to follow Jesus no matter the cost? While we are not required to quit our jobs today and follow an itinerant preacher walking from town to town, there are other things that we should consider. As you consider your life, are you living for yourself or for the Lord? Are there certain things that are holding you back from giving your life completely to Him? For some, it is riches. For others, it's fill in the blank. Whatever it is, will you consider giving that over to the Lord today? The cost may seem big at the moment, but when you realize all that God gives in return, you will see that it is worth the cost. A second thought. Remember that everything you have is from God. You remember that Jesus said it's very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom. He also said that with men, it is impossible. In reality, it's impossible for any man to enter God's kingdom on his own. It may not be riches holding us back, but we have sins of our own that do hold us back. We have a sinful nature that naturally rebels against God and doesn't want anything to do with him. Because of that, we will never turn to God on our own. Thankfully, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Consider what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. God, who saw all of our downsides, all our sinfulness, he showed mercy toward us. He loved us. He gave us life through Jesus, and God did it for each of us who have believed. If you have been saved, don't ever forget that it was God who did it and not you. Be sure to thank him for that today. And a final application. Remember that God can do the impossible. When Jesus told the disciples how hard it was for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom, he also told them that God could do what is impossible. Rich or poor, slave or free, smart or simple— None of that matters. God is able to save anyone despite their impediments. Do you know how he is able to overcome our impediments? Hebert sums it up nicely. He says, on the basis of the atonement, that means that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. So on the basis of that, he can provide the perfect righteousness which man can never attain. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, he can bring men to a change of heart leading unwilling and sinful hearts to accept the divine provision. Now, I read that quickly. Basically, what he's saying is, God can do the impossible. He sent Jesus to die for our sins. And because Jesus took our place on the cross, he can take the perfect, sinless righteousness of Jesus, because he paid for our sins, and he can give that to us, replace our sinfulness with Jesus' righteousness. He traded places. And he can change our hearts to accept that. Now, if you are a Christian, can you think of someone that you think is too far gone to be a part of God's kingdom, too far gone to be saved? With men, it seems impossible. There's nothing that we can do. But God can do what seems impossible. He can save anyone because he's God. So don't ever think that someone is too far gone to be saved. Pray for them. Present the gospel to them, and then let God do his work, changing the impossible to the possible. Now, in conclusion, the disciples had a wrong view of who would be a part of God's kingdom. At first, they thought that wealthy people were closer because they were obviously blessed by God with wealth. But they quickly learned the truth. 
The fact is that wealthy people have a hard time leaving all to follow Jesus. Then Peter piped up and reminded Jesus of what they had done. They, meaning the disciples, had left all while the young rich man had not. Jesus recognized this fact and promised blessings along with persecution for those who followed him. But then he ended by saying something that's kind of a, a cryptic saying. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Perhaps this is a good way to end the message. You may be a Christian who has left the world to follow Jesus, and that's good. Just don't think too highly of yourself. Instead of putting yourself high on the list, don't even focus on that. Just be faithful to the Lord, serve him with your life, and be thankful for all that he does for you.